Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Clark's Horrors, the show in which I set out to try and prove the existence of ghosts once and for all. So today I am heading out to the Clayton Tunnel in Hassex, West Sussex, not to be confused with the Clayton Tunnel in Bradford, which is about four hours away from me, and I almost ended up going there by mistake. So this tunnel is very unique, not just for its history, but its appearance as well. When approached from the front, it looks almost like a medieval fort with two struts, two towers, and a little cottage that sits in between them. This is actually inhabited to this day. People live there, although the land and the surrounding land is owned by Network Rail, obviously the train line people. So this tunnel was actually the scene of a crash between three trains in 1861, which left 23 dead and 176 injured. Some of the bodies were taken to the nearby fields and held until they could be dealt with there. Some were carried up to the top and placed in the back garden of this cottage. And some of the other ones were taken to the Hassex Hotel, which is very nearby, a little hotel. I will be visiting that as well today. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a background about the incident itself, and then we are going to go over there and take a look. I'll see you there. Clayton Tunnel is a railway tunnel located between the villages of Pycombe and Clayton. It's approximately one and a half miles long and was designed by David Mokata, an architect that worked for the railway line. This construction was completed in 1841 after three years work. A small cottage sits atop the tunnel between two gothic towers. Upon seeing the building you may assume it would be an incredibly noisy place to live, but that's not the case. If anything, it's the nearby road that is the only cause of noise disturbance, as the trains running beneath do little more than to cause minor vibrations. The story goes that when the land was sold to the railway company, the landowner stipulated that the tunnel entrance must be made distinctive, hence the medieval appearance we see today. The tunnel house itself was built in the 1830s and served as a wages office for workers toiling on the railway cutting. After that it became a mess room where gangers would hang out in their break time. It eventually became a dwelling house and was home to some bafflingly large families, despite its tiny stature. The first to rent the property were a Mr Russell and his wife. Russell was a head ganger and together they brought up a family of nine children. The third occupants, and a family of note in this tale, were the Atmeers, who rented the property from British Rail in 1956. Mrs. Muriel Atmere, later Mrs. Greenwood, loved living there because it was so peaceful and rural in spite of claiming the place to be extremely haunted. She did not find the ghost intimidating, for if she had, she would not have lived there for 38 years. One of the most active was a ghost she nicknamed Charlie. Though nobody knew his real identity, it was assumed he was the spirit of one of the old gangers that constructed and maintained the place. In one of the towers, there is a sealed off entrance to an inspection tunnel leading to ventilation shafts. It was in this inspection tunnel that footsteps were often heard, as well as screaming and sighs. When the tunnel entrance was doubly sealed, Muriel found herself thinking, Poor old Charlie, now he's stuck in there. Muriel also heard noises inside her home. On occasion, there would be a drumming sound on the table in her living room, as though somebody sitting there was tapping their fingers on the table impatiently. She would also spot a glowing on one of the towers. This glow outlined a man of medium height and build and was seen both at dusk and later at night. Whenever she would see this glowing, she would never investigate, but would instead turn around and go back indoors. Then there was the white lady. Although Muriel could sense her presence at times, she never actually saw this ghost herself. Muriel had 11 grandchildren, two of which would often stay, and it was these children that would scream in the night for their grandmother to come and make the white lady go away. In Muriel's back garden there was an orchard of apple, pear and plum trees. Although a lovely place, she did not care to linger out there after dark because of its powerfully sad atmosphere. This is unsurprising when you come to realise that the corpses of the people who had met their untimely end in the Clayton Tunnel had been brought out there and laid on that very stretch of grass. In fact, it was a marvel that the tunnel house could have been a happy home at all, and so many tragedies had occurred close by. 
The Clayton Tunnel rail crash took place on Saturday the 25th of August 1861, five miles from Brighton on the south coast of England, and was the worst accident the British railway system had seen up until that time. At the time, the Clayton Tunnel line worked on a time interval system, requiring trains on the same track to be separated by five minutes. Despite this, three trains actually left Brighton Station within seven minutes of each other. The first left at 8.28am, the second at 8.31am, and the third left at 8.35am. At the tunnel mouth, the first train passed, signal out clear. But alarm bells began to warn Killick, one of the signalmen, that it had not returned to danger. He sent a train in tunnel message to Brown in the north signal box, who was another signalman but he did not return the signal to danger in time to stop the second train from passing the signal and travelling into the tunnel. He was only three minutes behind and may well have caught up to the first train. Realising the first train was still in the tunnel, he rushed out of the cabin waving his red flag to stop the second train just as it was passing, but he couldn't be sure the driver had actually seen it. He then telegraphed Brown at the north end of the tunnel, is the tunnel clear? At that moment, the first train they cleared the tunnel, so Brown signalled back tunnel clear to Kellick. But unfortunately, Kellick thought that Brown was referring to the second train and not the first. In fact, the second train's driver had seen the red flag and had stopped about half a mile into the tunnel and at this point was currently reversing back to the south end of the tunnel. Meanwhile, Kellick saw the third train approaching and stopped his signal thinking the tunnel was now clear, he waved his white flag for it to proceed. The second and third trains then collided inside the tunnel with great force. The second train was pushed forward and the locomotive obliterated the guard van at the rear before smashing into the back carriage. It then rode up and over the carriage roof and smashed its chimney against the tunnel roof before coming to a stop. Many of the 23 deaths were in this last carriage where the passengers were burnt or scolded to death by the broken engine of the third train. A nine-day inquest was then held at Brighton Town Hall with the deaths. It concluded with the jury giving a verdict of manslaughter against Charles Legg, the assistant station master of Brighton Station, finding him negligent by starting three trains so close together, which was against the rules of the company. The jury did not find any negligence by either Sigmund Killick or Brown. Legg was convicted for trial for manslaughter, but was eventually found not guilty. Now there was actually a second accident in this tunnel in 1926, and also in 1973, three Territorial Army soldiers were killed there while taking place in a map reading exercise. Muriel Greenwood, living at the tunnel house at this time, gave evidence at the inquest. It wasn't until 1994 Muriel was eventually forced to leave her home because of ill health. She moved to a flat in Burgess Hill and died less than a month later. People since have claimed to hear shrieks and screams coming from the tunnel and the terrible crunching of trains colliding as metal scraped against metal. A nearby field where the bodies were laid is also reported to be haunted. Nowadays the Clayton Tunnel is a popular landmark for tourists and train spotters alike with its popularity boosted by the Charles Dickens classic ghost story, The Signalman. The tunnel itself is actually also home to a long forgotten secret passage and hidden chambers accessible by the towers. Some of these have obviously been sealed off, while others remain open to this day. Hello everybody, we have finally found the Clayton Tunnel. As you can probably tell, it is on a very busy road. Even so, it took me about an hour to find this place. I've been all over the golf courses, causing nuisance to them. But over here behind me is the tunnel itself. Now, I've actually just met the owner that lives in the cottage on top of the tunnel there. And he's given me his business card. He showed me around the back garden and gave me a little tour of the back of the place. But he has requested that I don't put too much on social media because there are things that they don't want everyone seeing and that's fair enough, respect their property. But he did allow me to take some pictures out the back, which I'll share with you shortly. There are no trains running today, so it's a nice quiet line. Unfortunately, at the moment, this is the closest that I can get to the tunnel. But again, he said, if I come back in the spring, 
gets a bit warmer he's actually going to be able to take me down closer he's going to show me all the little secret footpaths and tunnels down there as you can still go inside some of them so that is actually going to be fascinating i'm so excited for that but uh for now this is pretty much all i can do here without trespassing which obviously i'm not going to do so i think we're actually going to move on to the uh Asics Hotel and see if I can get into the basement of there somehow. That's obviously where they kept some of the bodies after the train incident. And I'll see you there. Hello everyone, so we're now currently sat in the car park of the Hassocks Hotel which it turns out, technically I suppose it is a hotel but it's just a very small pub I'll just show you So I'm going to pop inside but given the size of it and that it's actually a pub chances of me getting into that basement are very slim indeed so I'll just get a drink and have a little look around, I suppose. Now, the chap that I was just talking to, the owner of the cottage above the bridge, he's actually a descendant of the Greenwoods, which is the lady that lived there for so many years, and the one that lived there at the time of the crash, and she had the bodies in the field next to her house. Now, he said she lived there for many years, and she only moved out couple of weeks before she died and he has now lived there for 20 years but the bloke that lived there before him was there for about two weeks and he fled the place which i found pretty interesting so i didn't want to come across as too much of an oddball asking him about scary stuff uh, instead i put it across as more of a history buff interested in railway bridges um but i did manage to ask him if he's ever seen or heard anything there and his response was not really he said mm, yes and no not really i didn't want to press him too much because i might come across a bit weird again but he said you know you can see ghosts anywhere if you're looking for them but i did find it very interesting that the guy that lived there before him did actually free the property after only two weeks of living there because he was scared so uh, perhaps when I go back next time, as I say, he gave me his business card. And when I go back, I'll be able to ask him a little bit more about that and what he meant. But uh, yeah, let's go inside the pub now, have a little look around and see what our chances of getting down into that basement are. See you there. So I've just been inside the Hassocks, as it's now called, for a drink. Um, the place is not actually a hotel anymore. It's just called the Hassocks Hotel online from the old days now it's just a quaint little pub um i spoke to the barmaid briefly about the history of the place but she's actually given me a business card for the landlord that will hopefully be able to tell me a bit more about the uh happenings on that went on there i did ask her about the basement on my eternal quest to make a tit of myself and uh she said she's heard strange noises probably once she's worked here a few years nothing really though so um i'm gonna shoot this guy an email and see what we can get from that so that about wraps this one up guys this is turning out to be a two-parter now this obviously being the first second part will be filmed in late spring early summer when i go back to the cottage and uh, the lovely gentleman that lives there has obviously offered to show me around behind the scenes I'm going to be seeing a lot of the foot pass, a lot of dark spooky and scary stuff hopefully and uh, I've also sent an email off to the landlord of the Hassocks Hotel now. I'm yet to hear back, but I'll bundle all of that together in the next episode. For now, it's hard to say whether the place is haunted or not. Obviously, I didn't get a lot of time on site. I couldn't get into the basement of the pub. So it's very hard to say. Uh, we'll see. We'll have to wait till episode two. I'll see you there.